actually says that all So you don't have to open up Google and then drag it over there. Yeah. And it's going to go So it's yeah. As long as she's saving it in there, it will automatically back it up. But like if she saves it to her desktop, it's not going to back it up. So it's like one drive. But yeah. Yeah. Later. <laughs> I love it. 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 I love
Well, I was, and then I lost my connection. So he just put it in Okay, so I didn't mean to complicate it. <laughs> I briefly said something to Billy about it. All right. I can't get a star next year. I did because I said it. I said that it has been I do want to say more about that. QR code and a bitly on the front screen. <laughs> Give you all a moment just to take a screenshot or something of that so that you can get in. 
And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm going to be sitting down. I'm recovering from heel and um, ankle surgery, and I'm not standing a lot yet. So, <laughs> all right. So, who am I? My name is Farrah Faust. I am an instructional technology specialist in Virginia Beach um, City Public Schools. I also am a K-5 facilitator for Code Virginia, if you're familiar with that organization. I um, am also part of the VISTA Board of Directors. So you're here today to talk about computer science for the littles, grades K through two or the primary um, students. And to start with, we need to know what is computer science. So if you Google computer science, you get lots of different big, long definitions. This is an example of one of those. It's the study of computers, algorithmic processes, including their principles, their hardware, software designs, their applications, and their impact on society. In other words, what is computer science? Computer science is a way that technology makes life easier. How do we use technology to make our life easier? One of those universal questions. I'm going to skip this short video because we're having a few technical issues here in the room. But if you have access to the slideshow, please take um, a few minutes later on to watch this video. It's a video produced by Code Virginia, and it tells you that living in the great state, Commonwealth of Virginia, you have access and our students have access to all sorts of technology hubs, whether it's um, medical field, it's NASA, and rockets, whether it's Amazon and their um, centers and stations throughout the state. Why do we need to teach our students computer science? Because we live in the 21st century. We want our students to be productive students and or to live productive lives as citizens. And for them to do that, they have to know about computer science. Think about it. What job or career can you think of right now that doesn't involve some level of computer science? Even if you, it's just logging on or signing in for um, your paycheck to say, hey, I'm here. Here's my, and logging in your hours. So in the state of Virginia, if you were not aware, in 2016, the state passed a law that mandated that computer science be taught to all students in grades K through 12. Now, middle school students have electives, high school students have elective courses and other programs that they can get into. But at the K-8 level, especially K-5, there's not a lot. So it's up to us as the classroom teachers and the technology coaches to provide those learning opportunities for our students. There are six strands that are included in computer science, algorithms and programming, computer systems, cybersecurity, data and analysis, what's the impact of computing, and the network and the internet. I'm here to tell you, if you're not familiar with computer science, you are already teaching computer science. A lot of people get a little scared away by the title or the term computer science. But think about what you do during your regular day in a primary classroom. <laughs> If you are teaching classroom routines, if you are providing step-by-step -step directions for your students, whether it's how to pick up a pair of scissors and cut or how to line up at the front door um, to go to the lunchroom, you're teaching them algorithms, step-by-step -step directions in an order is a algorithm. So you're already implementing your standards in your classroom. Computing systems. 
Do your students use computers? Do they know the names and the parts of the computer? You're already teaching them some of the computer science standards. Cybersecurity, a big word these days in computer <laughs> science. Do your students have a district login and a password? If you're covering that, you're teaching computer science. Do your, teach, do your students know what personal information is? Do they know to keep their personal information secure and to themselves? You're teaching computer science. How many of you are teaching? Well, and I know we have a lot of tech coaches, but at the primary level, we collect data. How many of you, you know, think about when you're working with the primary <laughs> kids, they do tally marks. How many birthdays are in January and you teach them tally marks? How many birthdays are in March? And then what do you do with that? Do you make a graph? Do you make a chart? Do you make a pictograph? You're analyzing data and you're using it. You're teaching computer science. Weather information, how many of you have a little math chart or a center or in your primary classrooms? They have a, a math chart that they go over every day and you include the weather, looking out, taking data about what the weather is today, what's the temperature, that's part of computer science. Taking that information, say your little monthly weather chart, putting that information into a pictograph or a chart or a graph, you're interpreting and using your data. So you're teaching computer science. When we teach kids internet safety, cyber, um, about cyber bullies and how not to be a bully, how to handle bullying on the internet, we use at my school the think um, idea, think before you post, you know, how does it make you feel? Is it important? Those are all teaching students about the impact that computing has on our lives. Networks and the internet, just talking to your kids about this is the internet, that your computer's connected to the internet. You have to have a password to get on to the school network. That's how we keep it safe. All of that is um, teaching them about networks and the internet. If you use programs such as Seesaw or Schoology, Clever, ClassLink, Canvas, teaching students how to navigate and use those programs is teaching them how to use the internet. You're teaching computer science. So now that you already know or now that you know that you're already teaching computer science, let me share with you some other ways that you can use or integrate computer science in your classroom. The first one is by adding, if you have a word wall, adding computer science vocabulary words <laughs> to your word wall. If you click on the link on the slide, it will take you to a PDF of um, some very simple elementary level vocabulary that you can print out and add to a word wall. When you are teaching computers, uh, excuse me, when you're teaching math, science, social studies, language arts, it's very easy to incorporate computer science into what you're doing. And I'm going to be showing you some samples or examples of how to do that in just a minute. Um, whenever you are using a STEM activity, I know in my district, they have built into the curriculum and into the daily schedule for our kindergartners a little STEM time, and they provide little activities for the teachers to do. When you are working on a STEM activity, you're teaching computer science. If your school has a makerspace, or if they don't, you can put one in a classroom. If you have a classroom makerspace, makerspace spaces and activities where students go in and build and create and make, that's computer science. I'm going to provide you with some other resources that will show you how you can integrate 
um, computer science into what you're already teaching in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, I want to tell you is that computer science can be taught without a computer. So there are two kinds of um, teaching with computer science. There is plugged and unplugged activities. We're going to start with the plugged activities. Plugged activities just mean that to work or complete these activities, you need to have a computing device, whether it's a tablet or a computer or laptop, Chromebook. Now, the first one I want to talk to you about is Code for Fun. This is a great site that I discovered. It's good for students in kindergarten, first grade, maybe the beginning of second grade. It uses a program called Scratch Junior. Now, Scratch Junior is available on iPads and Chromebooks. It is not um, web-based, so you have to download the program. But what is nice about it is that it will show you lessons that are already made. So say you are teaching first grade and you're teaching animals. Well, you, they give you an example lesson here that is about farm animals, but you could change the topic. It could be any habitat that you want, whether it's the jungle or the farm. You could talk about domestic and non-domestic, undomesticated animals. But what's cool is that it gives you the whole lesson plan already written and gives you directions so that you can walk your students through this activity. You can also add to it. So this activity is very simple. It's having kindergartners, our first graders, go in and create a scene where you have a farm and they add three sprites or little images or characters to the screen. Now they can program each animal to move they can program the animal to say something. They can even program the animal to make a noise. So this would be showing, depending on their level of skill, what they have learned about the animals. And like I said, there are many different backgrounds. So you can go in and let me move this out of the way. You can go in and adapt it as you need. What's also cool about the site, Code for Fun, is that it provides you not only with a teacher lesson plan that's ready to use, it provides you with the slideshow to walk your students through it. The slideshow's done. All you have to do is put it on the project on the big screen, have your kids log in or log in, open up Scratch Junior. Scratch <laughs> Junior does not have a login. And then you have screenshots that walk your students through the whole lesson. How cool is that? Next is Brain Pop Junior. How many of you have a license to Brain Pop? Did you know that so many people use Brain Pop just for the videos and the quizzes? <laughs> Did you know that there is a component to Brain Pop called Creative Coding. And it allows you to use characters from the Brain Pop movies to do coding activities. So I have a, an example here. I'm not gonna play it like I said for technical um, reasons, but what it shows is this is a museum. So I have two long white museum shelves. Oops. And on my shelf, um, I have Moby. Moby says hi. If you click on him, he'll beep for you like he does in the movies. And then the students have added, this is really a first grade mapping lesson. They have added a globe, a map, a map legend, and the cardinal directions. And they would go in and program each object or sprite to say, I'm a globe. I show the whole world. 
I'm a map, I show a bird's eye view, but whatever they have learned about that element of mapping, they can add to their coding. So instead of giving them a quiz, have them create a project that shows what they've done. Now, if you're not familiar with BrainPop, I've included lots of links here for you. There is a museum project planning sheet that BrainPop has for you that you can open up so students can draw out, sketch out what they want to put in their project before they actually sit down in front of the computer. There is a scratch guide for teachers. So if you've never used block coding, there is a video with directions, and then there's also printed directions for the project, along with some additional information about the creative coding activities in BrainPop. <clears throat> BeeBots, how many of you are familiar with BeeBots? One of the first robots that you can introduce to primary, especially pre-K to first grade. B-Bots are battery operated or rechargeable robots. They have their controls or buttons on the very top of the robot. And you can um, put the B-Bot down on any flat surface and program them to move. What makes it cool though, is to create or use a mat. So to give you an example of how the BeeBot works, I have the BeeBot emulator. <laughs> and so you see the BeeBot is right here. And we have the controls. This is what the controls look like on top of the BeeBot. And if I wanted the BeeBot to go to the letter E, I know I need to go forward. One, two, three. So I'm going to go one, two, three. I hope that's working. And then I need to turn and I need to move one more time. And the bebop moves. The bebop moves in measured steps. So you can buy or print out bebop mats that allow you, um, the company that creates BeeBots has a big mat that you can buy that um, has a clear overlay. So you flip it up, you lay down your pictures or your words, you put the um, clear overlay back down, and then the, the BeeBot can be programmed to move throughout. I found an easier way to do it. I created my own slideshow using Google Slides and I measured it out. And so what I have done is I created little, um, little um, like question cards and then the big squares are the actual mat. So you would just duplicate this page however many times you want. I usually do a five by five grid and I put pictures or words. So an example would be, um, we did famous Americans for second grade. So I would either put the name or the picture of a famous American that second graders had to learn. And then I printed it out, cut out the squares, taped them together and ran it through the laminator. And I got a chart about so big. It's meant these squares are measured out. So this is one B-bot length, length. Then on the short cards, I would put the name or picture. And so the kids would use this as a stack of cards to draw. So they pull up a card, said Thurgood Marshall. Well, they would have to, to um, find Thurgood Marshall on the grid. And then they program the B-Bot to go to Thurgood. I started out by putting at um, on the mat in different locations. I never put them in the same place. A little starting um, around the edge, a starting place for the bebop so that the kids know when they're finished with their turn where to return the bebop. But lots of ways to integrate the bebop and bebop mats 
into different subjects. I was doing famous Americans. You could do weather terms. You could do math. You could do shapes. Can I have something else? Sure. Um, I found that it's six inches. And so if you have a 12 by 12 tile floor, <coughs> and each tile is, you know, four mm -hmm. of their <coughs> measure. It. Oh, eyeball okay. it when you need to eyeball it. Good, good tip. Um, another robot that you can <coughs> use is the Dash robot. What's cool, my district is an all Chromebook <coughs> district where we have very few iPads that work, uh, that we have available to connect to robots. But now there is a Chromebook um, <coughs> link. So students can connect to the Dash robot on the <coughs> Chromebook and program Dash. Dash is a, a step up, well, it's a couple of steps up from the cute little B bots. Um, Dash, you can program <coughs> to move around. He'll talk. You can even make recordings. It comes with, you can buy all sorts of attachments. You can put a camera on the top, a keyboard or a little xylophone where it can play music so you can integrate the arts. You can buy a little holder that holds um, magic markers which is great because you can roll out a piece of bulletin board paper. <laughs> Kids can program Dash to draw the shapes. If they're doing shapes, they can draw pictures, <laughs> whatever they you need them to program. They can use the little map marker attachment and then they have um, a written example of what they had programmed. So moving on to coding without devices. Now these are unplugged activities. And what research shows is that our primary students need to spend the majority of their time in computer science doing unplugged <coughs> activities where they're not attached to a computer or a, an iPad, a device. So what is an unplugged activity? Any activity that, in, uh, that includes a computer science concept or idea that does not involve the use of computer or other technology devices. And I have one exception, and I will talk to you about that when we get there. So some of the ways that you can incorporate <coughs> unplugged activities into your classroom or your school, library, learning commons, makerspace areas, are by adding activities that promote critical thinking and problem solving. One of the first ones that um, I like are activities like this learning resources. They're mats or little squares that the kids can lay down in the form of like a hopscotch mat and they have to follow the direction. So you can have them work on it independently. What makes it even more fun is you can have more than one student <laughs> do it. Have somebody called the programmer. The programmer can lay down the cards in a certain manner. Then the other students turn around and they have to follow the programmer's program or the squares to follow through with what they do. Some of them you can find will say things like hop on one foot, skip, um, skip a space, uh, different activities. This one in the picture is just showing arrows that the students follow. They can do games like mazes, rubrics cubes, getting them to think, how do I put that back together again? Dominoes, whether they are lining them up to make a huge maze that with one a uh, touch of your finger will knock them all down or just matching them up and making patterns with them. All of those are working on computational thinking, problem solving, critical thinking skills for our students. Another one, and this is the one ex exception to my unplugged activities do not use devices. How many of you use Seesaw? All right, Seesaw requires a device to use Seesaw. But once you get into Seesaw, 
There are literally hundreds of computer science activities that are unplugged where they don't need a robot that are available for you to use in Seesaw. This is just an example of one. And what a lot of them do is teaching kids to write an, an algorithm or program. They have, a lot of times there'll be a story connected to it. This particular example is the story, the old lady who wasn't afraid of anything. And so you read the story and then the students have to use the arrows that they'll drag over to the grid and they have to hit upon each item in the correct order to retell the story. So there you're incorporating language arts and computer science, because they have to think of the sequence, they have to do it in the correct order. Some other unplugged activities or ideas. There's Mad Libs. Anybody heard of Mad Libs? Mm -hmm. Thinking I love those. There's a link here to some that you can print out. They're great language arts based, having kids critical thinking skills. They're having to fill in what's that bearable, what's the missing word that they need to add in to make their Mad Lib make sense. Choose your own adventure. Now, when you click on this link, it takes you to a Google doc, a Google slide, and excuse me, it's a Google form. And the students have to go in and make choices so depending on their choice, their story changes. When they're finished, it produces a story document that has the story as they've written. So every student will have a different story depending on the variables, the choices that they make on the form. I'm not, and this is a fun one too. How many of you have ever um, had kids make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or make a butter sandwich or make something where they had to follow directions and you had one student write the directions and another student had to follow and they always leave something out. A great fun activity, great thing to do at the beginning of school sometimes or right before the holidays where kids are learning that if you don't do it in the correct sequence, you don't follow the correct algorithm, then it doesn't turn out. And then they have to debug. They have to figure out what do I need to do to fix the problem, to make it work. Another fun um, way to integrate math, a function machine. And I have a link to um, a free activity that I got off of Teacher Pay Teacher that has the little function machine. How many are familiar with the little math function machine? You put in a two numbers and you either um, add or minus, subtract, and it comes out with another number. Did you know you're teaching computer science when you did that? Ways. Um, it teaches input, it teaches output. You can also do it not only with math, you could do it with reading like CBC words. If I put, if I have a B and a T and I input an I, what's my output going to be? If I input an A, what's my output going to be? So, I'd like to leave you with this big resource. This is um, resource links to everything I've talked about and some additional ones. So if you're not familiar with code.org, please check it out. They have courses that have very, um, that have graded or categorized activities based on um, student levels, age levels. And so you can use one activity from one of their lessons or you can use a whole course for um, code.org. Here is a link to Code for Fun. That was that first website I showed you. It has computer science lessons for K through 12. And they include computer science terminology. 
But remember that you can also go in, here's that farm animal lesson, and you can change. It doesn't have to be farm animals. It could be habitats or it could be um, a different kind of, of animals, animals that live in the sea opposed to animals that live on land. Then we have, and I've just given you links to these if you're interested and you're not familiar with them, you can click and go to, I think it's Terrapin's name of the company that sells the bee box. There's um, information about the Dash. Dash also has a um, site where it has lessons by grade level and subject area. So if you are not familiar with Dash, you can go there and get some resources. The last little robot that I wanted to um, talk about is the Ozobot, even though I call it Ozobot. Um, <laughs> those British. Um, if you're not familiar with the um, Ozobot, it is a little teeny tiny, I mean, it's about this big, little robot that reads color. So students as low as, you know, kindergarten, four or five years old, can draw a line and the robot follows the line. You can use it for map skills. There are templates out there that leave little spaces. They're codes, color codes that students can draw in that allow the robot to spin around, speed up, slow down, spin around like a tornado. Older students can use the Ozobots with programming. They have block-based programming apps that you can access online. And what's really cool, and I haven't figured out how they do this, you take your Ozobot, and after you've written your program and it says send it to the Ozobot, you hold up your Ozobot to your computer screen and there's a little circle and you just hold it there and it will tell you when it's downloaded the program. Kids turn it off, turn it back on and it runs the program the kids have um, created. Pretty cool. If you click this unlinked um, link, it will take you to a list of all the unplugged activities available at code.org. My next unplugged link is a link to a whole list. I mean, it's a very long spreadsheet that has computer science, unplugged computer science lessons and their connections to um, content. So it tells you the grade level, it tells you the computer science concept, gives you a description of the lesson, and then it gives you a link to either the site or the lesson. And all of these are elementary level. So that is another great resource that you can take home with you. Another site, this is an oldie, but a goodie. Um, there is a site called CS Unplugged that got the whole thing started with you don't have to have a computer or a device to teach computer science. And you can go here and find several um, fun activities that you can do. What's great about CS Unplugged is a lot of their activities get kids up and moving. They're open-ended. So they have some games like the human computer. You don't have to use math terms. You could use social studies, science terms, and plug those in to the activities that the students are doing. Seesaw, for those of you who are using Seesaw, Why am I kill my mother? She just tried to call me. <laughs> Wait till I get back to my hotel room and say you ruined my whole lesson. My whole no. Um, 
Seesaw, CS in Seesaw takes you to a um, search result um, of all the, and it keeps increasing. How many do we have right now? There are 1,632 activities in Seesaw that are tagged computer science. These are ready to use. Some of them are independent where you don't need anything. You just share it with your students, assign it to them. There's some that will tell you that they, you need a book, you read the story, then you do the coding activity. And what's another great thing about Seesaw, you can um, filter it by grade level. So pre-K, K, first and second. Now in my last box, I have some coding sites that you can use. Scratch Junior, I mentioned before, Scratch Junior is a program for coding. It's a drag and drop block program. It's much simpler than the MIT version of Scratch. So Scratch Junior is made or was created for um, pre-K through second grade. Disadvantage to this is that it's easy to use because there's no login. Because there's no login, it doesn't save the student data. So the student's projects are saved on whatever device or computer they're using. So if they have a computer at home and they do a Scratch Junior project or they do it on an iPad, it won't upload it to their um, computer or their Chromebook. It's stuck on that device. Um, and if another student comes in, uses Scratch Junior on the same device, their projects are all saved. But it's a great introduction to block coding for kids. Codable is another fun site. Scratch Junior and Codable does not do not requ require any reading. So these are for our primary students, especially the littles that aren't reading yet. They have Codable has little flashing arrows at the beginning so that they know where to go or what to do. Follow the flashing arrows or click on the flashing arrows. Codable um, has increasing levels of um, difficulty. You can create a classroom and have your students sign on when they log in, you can track their coding activity. I have some more teacher resources for you. And then I'm a big component, especially in the primary grades, of using literacy anytime I can. So I found this grade or somebody shared with me, probably at a, a conference, a link to this Padlet and the Padlet across the top has the different categories of computer science strains. So debugging, events, um, conditionals, uh, cues, sequencing. And as you look down, it has either ideas for using sequencing in your class or it provides you with books, literature that Focus on sequencing. You know, one of our old standbys, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, um, it's in there along with several that I was not familiar with to begin with. But a great resource and a way to connect literature to computer science. All right. If you are interested in computer science and you want to learn more, check out Code Virginia. If you're not familiar with Code Virginia, Code Virginia is a statewide organization that supports and promotes computer science for all students and teachers. Code VA provides professional development activities and programs for all public um, educators across the state of Virginia. And you can check um, our website out to find out more about some of our opportunities. 
And if you have access to the slide deck, if you would please click on that link and just complete a short exit ticket for us. I'm just gathering data for my name. Do I have any questions? My contact information is up here. So if you have any questions or would like to contact me, please feel free to do so. And we have a few minutes on that now. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, three, two. Thank you. Um, no, it saves it in rain.